Welcome to a very special episode of Sales Off Demystified. We're joined by Ian Stewart of Risk Alive. Now, I think it's going to be an interesting chat because Ian has experience entrepreneurially and then five and a half years of experience in sales ops and is now currently director of sales operations at Risk Alive. So I think there's going to be some sweet insights here. Ian, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, can we kick off by trying to understand how you got into the sales ops role? Like, did you join Risk Alive as sales ops or as a different role and then switched into it afterwards? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was employee number 11 at Risk Alive. So being a startup, you have uh, a lot of hats. <laughs> so I was an account executive when I started um, doing a certain type of work, doing data projects. I helped implement Salesforce uh, and pretty much our uh, like operations functions while selling. So that was a fun guilty hat role. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, I was our Salesforce admin since the beginning when we launched with it, did implementation for that. Once we had a sales ops role come up, um, I was offered it and I've been doing that ever since I was realized. Cool. So were you the first account executive? Uh, I was the first account executive. I was the... Cool. And then uh, uh, how many years into your journey with the company did you switch out into the sales ops? Oh, sorry. Say that one more time. Uh, at what year in the journey did you join sales ops? Uh, year number one and a half. I think it was like, yeah, one and a half or two years in, I joined sales ops. Cool. And you were the wise, and then I have other years of sales ops experience uh, doing my own stuff. And were you the first sales operations person at Risk Alliance? No, we had another sales ops person for a couple months who was more like a finance, doing on the more finance side, and they reported to be the CFO. Um, and then I came after them when we moved it to sales. Cool. And so now you're running the sales ops team um, that supports all of the sales reps within Risk Lives. Yeah, yeah. So I'm underneath revenue operations. So we have revenue operations, sales operations under that. I have one analyst under me and a Salesforce admin at the end of their analyst. Great. And how many? Approximately how many salespeople are you guys supporting? Yeah, uh, we're supporting 40 salespeople and 20. Nice. So that ratio, I'm trying to track ratio. So that's if we take 60 in total, there's four of you um, between 60. That's about kind of what, what I've been experiencing. Um, current sales of tech stack. So I know you guys are using Salesforce. So you actually implemented Salesforce for Risk Life. What else are you guys currently using? Yeah, yeah. So Salesforce for CRM, um, using HubSpot for our marketing automation, uh, Zora, if you've heard of that before, uh, for CPQ and our subscription management, Domo for business intelligence, using Zoom for video conferencing, Chili Piper for, we just actually got Chili Piper um, for our appointment scheduling from the SDR team. Let's see, we're using Gong for our call recording and uh, sales enablement, Spring CM for contract management, DocuSign for e signature, Sales Loft for the SDR and cadences. We're using Cloud Bingo for some of our data management in Salesforce, and then we can be data feed set up called Discovery Data. Not just the board. <laughs> Got it. Quite a comprehensive overview there. Um, quick, quick, can you, uh, you, you'll sound like keeps getting a little bit muffled and then comes in and out. If you could have your mic like just close to your mouth, yeah, that would be even better. Um, awesome. Okay, cool. And so you, you guys as a sales team are kind of responsible for all that technology and making sure it's integrated and working together. Either that fits within your remit. Yep, that's correct. Okay. And then you're also responsible for, I guess, assessing new tools and then deciding whether they would or, or wouldn't fit within your stack. Yep. That's cool, fantastic. Um, can we move now on to data quality? You mentioned, I think, Cloud Dingo, which can help remove duplicates, if I'm correct. Yeah. Cool. Um, do you have any, like, what else are you doing to ensure that data is accurate inside Salesforce? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, this is a twofold answer. So, so one, the industry we're in, we work with financial advisors, so they are legally required to register their information with regulatory agencies. Um, so, like, we have public record on them. I have their last four home addresses, which is really cool. <laughs> and we have way too much data points. Um, and it's all public record. So, we have an, an API feed that we set up, which we pump in the sales force. Um, and so, what I do, I mean, I, I want that data to be as untouched as possible. So, we have something called data provided fields in Salesforce on a record. And then I'll have uh, human provided fields on a record. <laughs> um, primary. So, if someone wants to, 
who do they think the email address is of something versus what someone claimed their email address was because we have a monthly feed coming in from that data set, um, that database. We're not going to do that, but we're still going to not let to touch the system provided database provided information. So it's part of that, like they can have all their information in there, but then they have the backup of all the database provided information. And the second part is I have an analyst on my team, uh, Tiffany, who's awesome, and we can use incoming leads periodically, make sure that stuff, we're not getting duplicates created. If we are getting duplicates created, she's looking to see what type of rules and stuff we can implement. Um, and she's also, we have the ability for rep open a case in Salesforce anytime they are questioning like the, the data relationship as it's coming from discovery data. So if it's not in the right contact, they, they belong over here. Long email address or CRD number, that's how we have a unique identifier. So we look to identify that there. But uh, Tiffany is our, our steward of the data. Got it, shout out to Tiffany. So we have, so there's process in place so that salespeople can flag things that are going wrong. You have some manual stuff in there with Tiffany and then you also have these two different types of fields. Um, where you will prioritize data that a human's given versus data you've got from another source. Correct. Right. Yep, and we have Cloud Dingo who's going in uh, nightly and updating and make sure things are in the right relationship. So fantastic. Um, now moving on to the relationship that you guys have with the reps. How do you build that relationship and try to like get them on side with stuff that you might get them to do that might not be directly correlated with them uh, getting more commission? Yeah. Yeah, good, good, good question. Um, so a couple, a couple of different things there. So one, every Thursday, I'll come down and I'll shadow the rep. Um, what I'm doing is I'm all, <laughs> selfishly, I'm, I'm trying, I hope no one's listening to this, um, <laughs> trying to sell them on different things that we're doing. Um, yeah. Because most of the stuff we're working on, right, there's there's two types of projects sales ops normally does. There's the customer-facing stuff, right, that is going to affect sales um, and customer success. And then there's the stuff that I'm doing that's all that. I'm mostly going to see it. The revenue operations team is mostly going to see see it, it's Salesforce administration work and whatnot. So the stuff that's customer facing, when I'm shadowing the reps, I want to make sure that they, they're aware of what's going on. They know it's coming well in advance of it actually coming. Um, second thing we do is we we do two things. We have a roundtable discussion with all of our teams and uh, we're like a customer advisory board, right, of salespeople. It's a little team. They data different things that we're shipping and watching well ahead of when we actually launch it to the rest of the team. And that, that team is always changing. Um, so we'll sit down with those people and we'll go through what sales ops and rev ops are working on, what's coming down the pipe, different trends that they're seeing um, in the industry, trends that they're seeing in Salesforce, right? Um, when we talk to the managers and when we launch those new systems or processes, we have the beta team, they get early access to the, the system or process. We have a Slack channel. We'll do kind of like daily standups and talk about what's working, what's not working, get feedback on ideas for future iterations. So. Got it. So if I heard you correctly, you have a customer advisory board, but it's not customers, it's the salespeople. Yeah, yeah. So I <laughs> yeah, so what I learned early is to uh, to work with sales as a customer. Um not that the customer is always right or the customer always knows what they need, but to work with them like a customer. They're they're my primary business unit that's reporting. So Cool. And then every Thursday you go and sit with them, same time every week, you get them in a room and like understand what's going on for them and share what you're working on. Yeah, not so much get them in a room. Uh, we have an open office and we have two floors. So I'm up on the, the top floor and then I'll go down to the, the bottom floor and sit with them and just, we have some flex desks that are open um, and I'll go filter between those. <laughs> Got it. And so, so you'll sit down there all day? Yeah, yeah, I'll sit down, I'll get on gone calls, I'll listen with them, I'll give them some feedback on what they're doing in Salesforce, I'll just see what's going on, what's actually happening on the Nice. Um, how are you guys currently onboarding new salespeople? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, so I'm I'm not personally responsible for onboarding, uh, but what we do at Riskalyze, we use something called Lessonly. I don't know if you remember that. Um, so that's the other tech tech tech. <laughs> Lessonly and then Guru for knowledge mm -hmm. management. And so we have all of our really important documents and just pieces of knowledge in Guru. Guru lets you verify and and have like a trust rating on something. And it, it requires a verifier, so someone has to verify every three months or six months or something. So we have everything in there, so I have the freshest knowledge as far as the best way of doing something, talk track, it's gonna be. We have most of those documents in there. And then in Lessonly, we're walking them through like Industry 101, right? like how we work with advisors, how the data is going through Salesforce. And we, we do uh, about two weeks of onboarding. Um, SDRs are required to get on the phone in the first week, so that's that's pretty straightforward. I don't know if I can get a ramp of about a quarter to get up to speed, build that 
we normally have people, we're, we're pretty transactional, so we have people close the deal. It's not like one of the quarter. Uh, you're still just cutting out like every like 10 seconds or so, um, maybe because you're moving your, your mouth. Um, cool, okay, so Lesson Lee is, has content and it takes reps through as they join. Um, and then the other tool, Guru, you mentioned, uh, keeps asking you to refresh content so that you know it's up to date. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Cool. Um, moving on to productivity. What are you currently doing to increase productivity of all of your reps? Yeah, well, that's a good question. And I'm actually going to, I see Zach Smith asked the question of how we approach the process of filtering leads from marketing to sales. So that's a relevant question. Um, today, we actually just went back to the lead object in Salesforce. So what's been happening is we have, when marketing creates leads, they go to a queue in Salesforce. And that queue will have Tiffany um, and other people sit on that, and they'll go through and clean up the leads depending on the rating of the lead. But something that needs to go out immediately, we're, we're filtering that out and distributing it to the team and the sales team. But if it needs to be uh, reviewed again, maybe it's something from a conference or an attendee list, we're going to have Tiffany go through that. And people go through and analyze it, make there's no duplicates or anything. We just recently, for productivity, we now have it set up where SDRs are passing opportunities to sales, and so they're doing a lot of pre-qualification work, and they're also directly receiving leads now. Um, before, just for a lot of compliance reasons, we had SDRs, they weren't able to create leads or contacts because we require a CRD number, a bunch of different other compliance things. Um, and so now going straight to them, their process is not hindered. They can still create those leads. They can still create contacts, work those opportunities and create them. Um, we have a case created in Salesforce for us to go back and verify it. It's very rare we'll have to go back and verify something. We have most of it in the addressable market inside of Salesforce, thankfully, so we're um, blessed. <laughs> so we have all that defined in Salesforce, and then we'll, we'll go back periodically and clean up things that are net new incoming. Cool. Um, quick question on the FDR function. Inbound leads, do they, are they split between the whole SDR function or do you have, say, inbound SDRs and then pure outbound? Yeah, um, they were split up between the whole inbound SDR or the whole SDR function. Uh, we just recently, about two quarters ago, went to five inbound SDRs, which is about good for the volume we have. Cool. And have you seen that segregation of uh, process and skills work better or is it too early to say anything? I think it's too early to say anything uh, just because of the volume. We have we have some of them doing outbound work still. We don't have a, a large piece of, of inbound just yet, partly because our, our target markets, like their average age is 60, 65. So we're, we're working with a unique set of, of, of prospects. Um, yeah. So really just quite as, it's, as it's working right now, it, it's looking good. Um, we have higher conversion on those, those segments, so it's, it's looking good now. Cool. And you have seen increased productivity from having FDRs qualify before going to the AEs. So that part we just launched today. So I can't tell you that oh. much. <laughs> <laughs> A bit early for that. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. And then I, uh, I think quite a few of your, or like your tech stack is pretty comprehensive, right? So I assume... Uh, a number of those tools were brought in to boost productivity, such as I think you mentioned Salesforce, right? Um, right. Like that, that, that would like revolutionize productivity. Awesome. Okay. Um, can we quickly talk about sales forecasting? And I'd be interested to know if you guys are responsible for like producing the forecast that goes up to revenue, that goes up to the VP of sales, or yeah. are you helping managers, sales managers uh, create the forecast with the data and process you create? Yeah, yeah. So we're doing both. Uh, I will do a forecast based off of um, currently closed production against open pipeline with historical close rates. Um, the method will change. Sometimes we'll do standard deviation, um, depending on just to give us like a range of what we're expecting, the 95% probability, mm -hmm. right? So we'll do that. And then the managers do pull a forecast, which is the, the culmination of the reps forecast rolling up to them. So we have them call their forecast every week, uh, I believe every Friday morning, 10 o'clock, they have to update their pipeline, make sure it's up to date and good to go. And then Monday morning, we make the call. Cool. And, and so you like, are you saying that then you have two forecasts that you combine or do you compare the different forecasts? We don't combine them. We, we compare the different ones. So I look at my okay. forecast against the roll up of the reps. Um, normally, if my forecast is looking better than theirs, I know that deals are missing. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. are missing in the process. Or if theirs is looking better than mine, I 
can normally go down and look and be like, oh, this person thinks this opportunity is way more valuable than it actually is. <laughs> go have a chat with that person. So work with them. Okay, so then yeah, so you, then you'll analyze and then you'll go back to the managers and then they might go and speak to the rest to get more info. Yep. Cool. And then you submit that final uh, forecast to, I assume, VP of sales or finance? Uh, CEO. Yeah, CEO, finance, yeah. and VP of sales. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to switch up the question here a little bit. Which um, You've been in this role for approximately three and a half years, right? Um, during this time, which KPI or metric has been the most insightful? I know it might be a hard question to ask, but which metric do you think has given you like really interesting insights about sales performance? Sales performance is a good question. Um, so we track something called D-books. I don't know if you've ever heard that term. <laughs> um, so a D book is a deal that was signed and then regressed uh, pretty much out of a booking. We, like we booked it and then it pretty much turned into not a booking for a variety of reasons, right? Because normally when you're booking something, it has different terms and stuff. You have to hold people to term and all that. Um, but for a variety of reasons, we'll see things degrade there. So that's that's been the most interesting as far as like a rep's personal D book rate. Like when they book, yeah. what actually like turns into not a real deal or like an implementation failure, a, a whole variety of different things. Um, so that's been the most interesting, like per rep. Other than that, I think something which is just like a heat map. Um, it's a scorecard of every rep, and I have it going back to 2016, 2015, um, which is every rep and their performance for the entire time they've been at Riskalyzed. Different quotas, different Not attainments, everything. And so that's, that's been the most helpful because I can plug that into Domo and I can do a lot with that. Nice. Um, on the deep bit rate, so would that feed into say coaching by the manager if you see over the past three quarters a rep has had a higher than average the book rate would then you send the manager in to go and tweak their approach to closing yeah yeah so we'll work with the manager um we'll we'll get into gong so if you're familiar with gong it's call recording rights so yeah. we'll get the actual call that led to that deal um pull out some specific areas in which that could have um in, in, increased that deep rate <laughs> and work with the manager on that Nice. That's it. Yeah, definitely have not heard about the debug rate before, but that's an interesting one. Um, final question. Who uh, in the sales of the world has, has taught you uh, like what you know and who would you like to take out to lunch to thank them for the knowledge they've imparted? Yeah. Uh, Jeremy Donovan from Sales Loft has always been just super warm and welcoming. And <laughs> I've, I've hit him up a couple times on LinkedIn and been like, hey, can we jump on a call and ask him a couple questions on stuff I was working on? Um, he's awesome. He'll, he'll just jump on stuff. He has a blog that he does a ton of really good, valuable book reviews. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with MSP modern sales pros, but he's also in there. Yeah. And yeah. there's so much knowledge in there. Um, so very so did, cool community, but yeah, Jeremy Donovan, I would take him out to lunch and then Franco Anzini. I do two people. <laughs> Franco's from uh, Bites. Uh, he, I met him at OpStars a couple years ago, conference down in San Francisco and, um, he's, all around cool dude has really knowledgeable about sales comp. Taught me a lot of what I know about sales compensation and kind of the method there. Um, nice shout, one shout out to that. Number th third one. No, I said from one phone call. Perfect. Okay, cool, got it. Yeah. Um, okay, awesome. So that was quick fire round. Here, here are the things that I liked. Actually, going and sitting with the sales team, I think, is really powerful because, especially with you being on a different floor, right? Yeah. It's like. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that there is a vibe like this, but there could be a vibe where they're like, oh, the sales ops team are up there, we're right here, and you're like different teams. And so that, I think, is such a good idea. Um, having a cut, like the concept of a customer advis advisory board, but as your customers or salespeople, that's the first time we've heard that. And then debug rate uh, is the first time I've ever heard that metric. I'm over 40 uh, interviews now. So that's super interesting insight. Um, Ian, thank you so much for that quick fire round. Loads of like, Boom, boom, boom. Answers to the questions. Um, highly valuable. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it.